this is the, uh, the title to my presentation. I gave a similar presentation to uh, a group up in Oregon um, uh, for CSEP a couple years ago, and we talked about the fact that it does take two to make public-private partnerships happen. Um, it's not just uh, the public can't force it, uh, the private sector can't force it. There's got to be value on both sides, and, and, I'm, and we're here to talk about that today. So. Um, I was reading, I was kind of prepping for this presentation a little bit yesterday and um, I was reading about great presenters and they talked about not over preparing and not under preparing but finding the, the middle ground. I've done a lot of preparation so I feel like I've over prepared but uh, I'm looking for the middle ground. So the middle ground to me means that we all participate because me standing up here talking for 70 minutes and by the way there's donuts in the back that I brought. I know you all just had brownies and everything else, but I thought, how else could I make them fall asleep? So I thought I'd bring donuts. <laughs> and so if you do get hungry, walk back there and get a donut. And uh, I'll talk about why I brought donuts with me. They're actually my favorite donuts. They're done for donuts. And uh, one of my vices is a done for donut and a Coke. So um, it's a bad vice to have, but I do have it. So I want to make some acknowledgments real quick. Um, I hope you can see this. If you can't, maybe they'll make the slide presentation available online. Um, but I will do my best to describe what, what you're not seeing or what you're kind of seeing. So I want to make some acknowledgments because um, I, I found, uh, you know, I've done a lot of, I did, when I was at the state, I did a lot of presentations, but I did a lot about our program, the Beer in Utah, their program, the Beer in Utah program, and Ready Your Business. And so um, I really tried to get away from that a little bit because I'm not with them anymore. And, get uh, a, a more, uh, a different view, different viewpoint. And so I actually took quite a bit of my presentation out of a FEMA training course, IS660 Introduction to Public-Private Partnerships. And I wanted to ask in this room, uh, this group, how many of you have taken that course? Really? Oh, how many? Raise your hand up by. Four? Okay, good. So, oh, excellent. So I would encourage you to take that course. If you fall asleep from donuts or over, over sugaring yourself today, you can go on and take that course and it'll give you a good understanding of what I'm talking about. Um, and if you have taken the course, you might notice that I did actually take some slides from the, from the course because they're uh, very good in explaining public-private partnerships. Journal of Strategic Security. Um, this is a really good white paper that talks about the role of public-private partnerships. Um, there is a link. Uh, to that article, fading, and uh, you can get that link either from here or, or again when they post this on the, online. And then uh, other other things that I pulled from American Red Cross Association of Contingency Planners, Forestry Research. I'll be talking about Sandy City's Emergency Management Program, uh, Florida DEM, and Dunford Baker's my favorite baker. All right. So here's a quote from Craig Fugate, one of my favorite quotes when talking about public-private partnerships. There's no way government can solve the challenges of a disaster with a government-centric approach. It takes the whole team, and the private sector provides the bulk of services in everyday community. Does everybody agree with that? Okay. Does anybody know how much of our infrastructure nationwide is owned by the private sector, owned and operated by the private sector? Percentage? Anybody? 80%, actually more than 80%. Um, so it's obvious that since uh, the government doesn't own and operate the, the uh, critical infrastructure in this country, that we need to create partnerships with those that do. And we have some really good examples of that here in Utah. We do a very good job of it. I've done a lot of research of other states, um, other programs, and I think that, uh, that overall we do an excellent job. We have good programs here, but I think that there's more to learn and I'm here to present some of those things that I found um, today. So I'm going to read something now. I didn't memorize this, so like I said, over prepared. But it says, on May 22nd, 2011, one of the most powerful tornadoes in American history ripped through Joplin, Missouri. Can you hear me back there, Ty? Barely? All right. I'll... I'm going to read this. On May 22nd, 2011, one of the most powerful tornadoes in American history ripped through in Missouri. I'll just talk louder, Ty. You can set up closer. 
this doesn't work and it's turning on and off. That's it, you're fired. Yeah. With winds in excess of 200 miles per hour, the tornado destroyed everything in its path, tragically killing 158, wounding over 1,000 and damaging up to 30% of the city, some 8,000 buildings total. The emergency response efforts began immediately, and with each passing hour, the scale of the disaster became increasingly clear. The principal of Joplin High School remarked to a reporter, you see pictures of World War II, the devastation and all that went with the bombing. That's really what it looked like. I couldn't even make out the side of the building. That's really what it looked like. Um, it was total devastation in my view. I just couldn't believe what I saw. Missouri Governor Jay, uh, Nixon underlined the scope of the state's recovery efforts. As a state, we are deploying every agency and resource available to keep Missouri families safe, searching for the missing, providing emergency medical care, and beginning uh, to recover. And among the many organizations that began, that began recovery operations, business imme businesses immediately <coughs> assumed substantial and broad-ranging roles to help restore Joplin to a sense of normalcy. Home Depot and Walmart each pledged $1 million to assist with the disaster relief. Moreover, Home Depot partnered with Delta Airlines to fly in 200 volunteers from Atlanta, Georgia, area businesses. Home Depot also delivered goods to assist in relief efforts, in addition to clean-up supplies from Georgia Pacific, as well as food and beverage from Chick-fil-A and Coca-Cola Company. The Empire District Electric, Electric Company, which serves Joplin, teamed up with neighboring power companies to restore electricity and natural gas services to Joplin residents. The mobile phone company Sprint provided cell phones and satellite phones to local emergency officials. Numerous firms deployed to Missouri, the emergency, Missouri Emergency Operations Center to help coordinate response and recovery efforts. A Texas-based development firm, Wallace uh, Bajali Development Partners, began consulting with the Joplin City Council to attract private investors for residential and commercial reconstruction projects. Government and business worked together effectively uh, to begin the rebuilding process in Joplin. It's a great example of um, how partnerships came together to rebuild and reestablish normalcy in, in the town of Joplin. So I'm going to talk uh, about uh, these three pages. Uh, so the second, the second page, was, like I said, is a letter from the mayor, and then the third page gives you an example of what the typical agenda looks like for those meetings. So what I like about the first page is that uh, they're very direct about what their program is. It's clearly defined. And that first paragraph lays it out. The Sandy City Business Continuity and Disaster Management Program is the quarterly connection between Sandy City and its business partners with issues regarding emergency preparedness and business continuity following a disaster. So they clearly define what they're trying to accomplish with their, with their program. Um, the second lays out their meeting structure, and I like it because there's not too many meetings. The private sector doesn't have time to attend a lot of meetings, um, so, that, so they hold, hold these uh, meetings quarterly. There's four meetings a year to bring them together to have simple conversations, right? Um, also, they provide lunch, which is nice. Um, I used to always go to PCDM knowing I'd get lunch. That was good. I think that brings people in. I mean, I brought donuts today out of the room. So um, that's the second paragraph. Then if you jump down to uh, uh, the, the bullet points, these are the typical agenda items that they went over, and I thought that, that would be good to share with you some of the things that any community can share. Is talking about CERT training for employees, SBA loans, um, establishing business emergency communications plans, because communication is very important to the private sector when it comes to public-private partnerships, and uh, the list goes on. Um, it's easy to register and you get direct contact with your emergency manager. Um, that's down at the bottom. He gives his name, he gives his phone number, his email, and how to register for those meetings. Still okay in the back? Can you hear me? Okay. So um, I just really like how they established that program, made it simple for people to attend, and uh, made the meetings meaningful and not too many of them. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a model that can be used around the state. Um, all you have to do is approach uh, some public officials because I think that one of the reasons they were able to fill the room with businesses in Sandy is because they had their mayor on board um, providing support to the program. I think that uh, um, providing a, 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 a place to meet, which is the Sandy City Hall, which brings businesses down to talk to their emergency manager and meet their emergency manager is an excellent idea. And involving the chamber was important too. Um, now, I don't know 
uh, where things went with some of the, the chambers that I met with and, and, and pitched this idea to them and emergency managers. But I think that that's a good place to start. If you don't know how to reach the businesses, set a meeting with your uh, local chamber of commerce and uh, maybe your mayor and talk about these issues, talk about the importance of establishing public-private partnerships to help small businesses in your community uh, to be prepared for disaster. Not only be prepared, but be in communication with you um, and, and provide that value not only to them, but to you as an emergency management program. So I want to share a video now. Uh, I think I have to click on it. This is from the training that the FEMA training that I shared with you. Ninety percent of our companies don't deal with disasters on a daily basis. I mean, much more than ninety percent. And so the biggest challenge is just is just frankly that dealing with disasters is not a core competency. So we have to learn, we have to rely on disaster experts to tell us how to be able to relate and how to function and all the rest of it. We need to really reach out through the associations and through the partnerships of working with the private sector so they understand how we operate, we understand how they operate, but more importantly, we get past this artificial division that says government does this and the private sector does that and go, we need to be a team. We struggled for some time after Hurricane Ike came through um, and devastated many of our chemical plants with water. These plants are critically essential to this community. These plants need their employees, and they need them on site, and they need them to be working every hour of the day. The problem is that their employees also suffer the loss of their homes and, um, and their livelihoods. What I learned over a lot of disasters was instead of competing with the private sector, we really need to be working as partners. Oftentimes we've been asking the wrong question. We've been asking what the private sector can do to support our mission. We should be asking the question many times, what can we do to help the private sector to get back operational? You know, for every grocery store, for every pharmacy, for every hardware store that opens up, in a disaster area means there's fewer demands for the government to provide those resources. And since the private sector already has a much more efficient mechanism for providing those services, it only makes sense to work as partners. It is imperative that businesses understand the ramifications of what happens when you have no power for an extended period of time. It's uh, that when your facilities are destroyed in some way or another. Uh, when you have no employees or your employees are suffering needs, how do you address that? The best way to do that is to be prepared ahead of time. Uh, given the fact that so much of critical infrastructure is managed or controlled by the private sector, uh, the most important thing business can do is really recognize the interdependence that exists in communities and be prepared to work not only cross-sector between public and private, but also across industry sectors. You look at um, the chambers from Beaumont, Texas, all the way to Mobile, Alabama, after Katrina, Rita, and Wilma, and we had, what, over 120,000 businesses disrupted in the Gulf Coast just south of I-10, let alone the hundreds of thousands that were connected to all of that. So um, when you've got a chamber that's got 80% of its membership disrupted, you know they have a vested interest to try and, and be a part of the longer term recovery. How do we work to ensure that as we go through these cycles of disasters, we come out stronger and that we make our communities more resilient against future threats? We're not going to be able to do that unless the private sector is part of the team. this on? This working? Okay. They got me a handheld, so we'll use the handheld. Uh, I really like that video. I've, I've used that video a number of times in presentations, uh, and there's some really good questions that are, are posed in that video, and I actually want to propose some of those to you for discussion. So, um, one of the first questions that came up uh, was, was from a chemical plant operator. Uh, his name was Bobby. Um, and this was his question. He said, um, well, he talked about the chemical plant being uh, critically essential to their community. Uh, and I want you all to think, to, to, I'm going to give you 15 seconds, I'm going to be silent. I want you to think of what companies are critically essential to your community. 
Um, have you identified them? Have you approached them? Invited them to the table? I'm going to give you 10 seconds to think about what companies are critical and have you invited them to the table? All right. Um, one of the questions that uh, Administrator Fugate asked was, uh, what can we do to help the private sector get back to operation? So I'm going to pose that question to the audience and see what your responses are. What do you think, um, again, I'll, I'll read it to you one more time. He said, what can we do to help private, the private sector get back to operational? What do you think we can do? Because I'm not the only one, I'm not the one with all the answers. So I'm here to facilitate a discussion. Anybody with ideas? Ty, thank you. You're welcome, Ryan. I was just thinking that they would need information. So relevant, current information about uh, the disaster scenario, transportation route, expected restoration dates on power. Um, so just starting with information, I think it's good for them to make the decisions that they need to, to come back online. Excellent. I can tell you from Moving over, I've only been in the private, I came from the private sector before I worked for the state. So it's not like I don't know the private sector, but I haven't been in a position of doing business continuity planning for the private sector until I moved over to Zion six months ago. And I do have a different perspective now being outside of the public sector um, as to what is important to us. And communications is probably the single most important thing to our organization. Um, I don't think. Brian Garrett made it today. I don't see him in here. That or he can't stand me and he's over in the other room. Um, but uh, if he was, I'd make fun of his purple shirt, but he's not here, so dang it. Um, but anyway, I talked to him about that and I said, I said, you know, in, in your opinion, what do you think, um, having been in science for quite some time, is the most important thing that we need? And he said the same thing, communications. We need information. We have to have information. And then he made us a, an interesting point, and that was that Business decisions are made not just uh, locally, so what he meant by that, and he elaborated, was if an event happens in Moab where we have a branch, um, the decisions, the business decisions that are going to be made about that event aren't going to take place in Moab. Those business decisions are going to take place in Salt Lake. So we need to know about events that, that occur in Moab, and how do we get that information? Do we get it from the state? Well, how does the state know that information? Do they get it from the local emergency manager, how, how does that work? And so that was a question that, that I wanted. I said, I, don't, I honestly don't know how that works. And so, yes. But it's on the same notion that we're working with pharmacies in Salt Lake County. Here, I'll give you this. We're working with pharmacies in Salt Lake County um, on a project. And it's something that is, you know, they don't want to make the decision on the local level if they're going to be dealing with issues on the state level. They want one MOU that would cover the whole, the whole area. So it ends up being an issue for those types of businesses that are you know, found throughout the state because they don't want to play on the local level as far as making those commitments on, on what they're going to do. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? So this is a, I think this is a good place to bring up um, UtahEmergencyInfo.com. How many of you are aware of UtahEmergencyInfo.com? It's actually Emergency Info Utah. Sorry, EmergencyInfoUtah.com. That's how I knew it. Um, EmergencyInfoUtah.com. Um, now ask, ask yourself the same question. How many businesses in my region, in my town, in my city know about that website? and know that they can get disaster information from that website. Since I've been at Zions, um, I've received those updates because I'm on that list, sir, because I went and made the few clicks that it takes, which isn't very much, to sign up and, and received uh, confirmation and started getting alerts. So when we've had some of the storms that we've had this winter, I've received those alerts and have been able to forward those um, to the people that make decisions in, in our company. It's extremely important information. It's extremely useful information for us. Um, some of the other things that we look for, uh, a couple, this is a week and a half ago, we experienced a power outage um, in our most critical facility. 
um, in, in West Valley. It was uh, about a week and a half ago when we had, it might have been two weeks ago, when we had uh, uh, some freezing, freezing rain that snapped some power lines um, out in West Valley off the 201. And we have massive generators that run our uh, critical building. Um, and so the generators kicked on and everything was working fine, but uh, things start to get a little dicey when in a half hour, 45 minutes, the power doesn't come back on, which is what typically happens, right? So five hours from when the power went off, the power still wasn't back on. Then we started really wondering, we need to figure out when this power is going to come back on because we only have so much fuel and we didn't know whether or not it's time to start calling fuel people to come and refuel the generators. And so that's the kind of information, and that information doesn't necessarily come from uh, an emergency management agency, but it does come from a partnership, a cross-sector partnership, which is another type of partnerships. And those cross-sector partnerships are developed um, through organizations like the BCDM, and organizations like the Private Sector Emergency Coordinating Council that the state runs, and any programs that you have locally where you bring businesses together to not only have conversations about emergency management, but to simply meet each other. It's very simple for me to give Amy Shingleton at Rocky Mountain Power a call because I know Amy. And I can ask Amy, what's the power grid situation? Do you have any idea when we're coming back on? If I didn't know Amy from Adam, that sounds weird, <laughs> uh, then uh, I, I wouldn't know who to call. And so those are, the, those are some of the reasons that we establish these partnerships. All right, let's move on. All of you have seen, probably seen this stat somewhere um, and written 10,000 different ways because I've seen it written a lot of different ways as well. But an estimated 25% of businesses that close as a result of disaster never reopen. And 40, I think this is the bigger part, 40 to 50% of the rest of them close permanently within two years. So think about how that would affect your community, about how that would affect uh, the <clears throat> income to your city. Uh, if you have a lot of businesses in your community, small businesses, who don't have people that do continuity planning for them, um, who don't have any connections with uh, local emergency management to help them, um, who end up shutting down because of that. Small businesses play a key role in the Utah economy and the local communities. So what are uh, public-private partnerships? Um, I think that the relationships are built on these things. Needs, each member uh, has to uh, it has resources or support it needs from the partnership. So each member of the partnership brings its own unique set of capabilities and two-way communication. We've talked about communication. What are some of the capabilities that can be leveraged from public-private partnerships? What are some of the, um, the uh, capabilities that were leveraged out of the uh, shakeout in 2012? Anybody from the state? Can you tell me what happened with Rocky Mountain Power and Questar. Did you guys talk about critical infrastructure? Yeah. Those conversations take place? Yeah. Yes, they did. Thank you. What what took place? What what was the conversation about? I know they did an after action uh, review tabletop follow up to see you know kind of their their short call. Okay. I know that, that uh, a discussion ensued about um, critical plants, critical facilities, critical locations for restoring power to critical facilities. I know that critical transportation routes came up so that the Division of Emergency Management knew what roads are going to need to be opened based on the fact that uh, Rocky Mountain Power is going to be able to use those roads to then restore power. And the same types of conversations happened with Questar. So ask yourself the same question in your areas. Have you talked with your critical infrastructure players? Do you know what facilities are critical to them? Do you know how to help them restore those facilities? Do you know if they have any transportation routes that they are counting on being open? Have those conversations. That's the capabilities that can come out of it. Uh, and other, other capabilities or resources, um, examples. Uh, when I, when we uh, had the Harriman fire, um, I was state at the time and was the private sector liaison and was on the phone with Walmart talking about how we might be able to provide uh, food and water for uh, the shelter in Harriman. And they ended up actually not needing uh, us at the state because the people, the emergency management crew in Harriman um, had already established a relationship with Walmart, the local Walmart um, in, in Harriman, and also with other 
local businesses. So the firemen up on the hill were actually eating, eating Olive Garden instead of Lunchables, which were probably would have come from Walmart. So, um, and Walmart sent a lot of food and water over to the local, um, to the local shelter. And so that was a really good uh, learning experience that to, to find out, okay, we do have a local uh, emergency <coughs> management program that's got relationships established, the private sector has resources that they can provide. All that needs to take place is the conversation. These are some of the activities that can come out of uh, having a public-private partnership. Um, obviously, we can educate the public on emergency preparedness. I think it's all of our goal to educate 100% of the public all the people that live in our communities, we want them to be prepared, right? How do we reach them? Do we have the resources to reach them? Who has plenty of money for advertising for preparedness? I know I didn't, even with Be Ready Utah. We didn't have a huge budget to go out and buy billboards all over the place and promote preparedness like crazy. We just didn't have that kind of resource. But through uh, working with the private sector um, and chambers of commerce and uh, associations, we were able to spread that message um, to a lot of people and get into a lot of homes with that message. Ensure the efficient and effective use of available resources during an emergency. We talked about that. Um, participate in emergency operation centers. And jo uh, conduct joint training activities. I think that that is something that um, I personally would like to see more. I, I would love to be um, to see more of the emergency management community in Utah inviting the private sector to participate in training activities, um, in exercises, if you're, if you're conducting exercises, because I think that um, they don't exercise enough. I mean, it's difficult for us, literally, to get our, our facilities to do an annual evacuation drill because things are just so busy and people have their minds on other things. And so to go beyond that and to say, well, now, after we've done an evacuation drill, why don't we go, to, go do a full-scale exercise? It's just not going to happen. Um, or even a functional exercise is difficult. So if we had the opportunity through relationships with our local emergency management community and knew that they were putting on an exercise and invited us to the table, it would be very uh, helpful and useful, especially for a small business. <coughs> so let's talk a little bit about forms of partnerships. There's a lot of them out there. Uh, some of them are formal, and a lot of them are informal. I think both are very effective. Um, I think more gets done with informal partnerships. So some of the examples of uh, formal partnerships, Chicago First. Um, you can look that up, chicagofirst.org. That's a uh, 501c3 nonprofit organization. Um, they have a board, they have bylaws, they have a lot of good resources, and they do a lot of very good things to, um, to promote and construct preparedness initiatives in the Chicago area for the businesses and emergency management community. Um, a very good program. ACP is an example of a private sector organization uh, formal organization that invites the public sector to the table. Um, we do have a local APC chapter in Utah, um, and we invite the public sector be, to be a part of that. I know that uh, quite a few members of the, of the public emergency management community come to some of those meetings, and, and that's where you can uh, meet with some of the, the business continuity people out in the, world, in, in the community. Talk a little bit about informal partnerships, which I think are uh, easy to establish, uh, easy to maintain, and can you can get a lot done with them. I'll give you a couple of examples. So you can do listservs, non-contractual agreements. Um, I would call Sandy City's program, you can agree with me or not, Jared, informal. Would you agree with me? Yeah. It's informal because there's no cr contracts. Um, there's no formal written agreements, are there? It's just an opportunity for you and the private sector to get together and talk about emergency management related issues according to your city, correct? So informal. The private sector emergency management co uh, coordinating council with the state is also, you might think formal, but it's informal. There are no written agreements among the partners. There's no uh, bylaws. There's no um, board of directors or anything like that. It's simply an opportunity to get together and network and have conversations. So let me give you a couple of examples that you may not know about. If I can find my notes over there. This is uh, Florida's outdoor advertising and emergency, manager, uh, and emergency managers to use electronic billboards to deliver, deliver disaster information. This picture actually here is uh, 
uh, Massachusetts Emergency Management, but they kind of have the same thing going for them. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll read to you about Florida's. In 2008, the state uh, Department of Emergency Management created a partnership with the outdoor advertising industry, um, Florida Outdoor Advertising Association. Digital billboards allow emergency managers to reach motorists at no cost to the public. Emergency officials use high-tech billboards to communicate targeted messages on weather warnings, evacuations, shelter locations, and road detours. Via this partnership, emergency authorities have access to more than 100 digital billboards in Florida. Billboard operators post emergency information on a voluntary basis. Goals of the project include enhancing the state emergency response team's ability to communicate critical information quickly, quickly to Floridians during disasters. Uh, use the latest technology to communicate emergency information to mobile residents and visitors outside the home. Cultivate public-private partnerships. And here's, a, here's an example of what their billboards look like. So this is one for hurricane, and then this is one that happened for a chemical spill. What do you guys think of that? Pretty cool, pretty easy. It's a simple conversation, probably I don't know, maybe six or seven conversations happened, uh, going up the line, the chains of authority before the partnership was established, before everybody was in agreement, that this would be a no-cost way of getting messages um, to the public. There is no, uh, I mean, they did, they do have some, some formal things written, but there is no contract between the Florida Division of Emergency Management and the Outdoor, uh, outdoor Advertising uh, Agency that does this. That is a, a, a great form of what I call public-private partnerships. They don't have to be in the form of a meeting. I think that um, when I think of public-private mar partnerships, obviously the first thing that comes to my mind is the Coordinating Council, uh, ACP, um, the BCDM. These are meetings, right? But that's not the only type of par partnership that's out there. You can do simple things um, that aren't necessarily a, a meeting-based partnership. We talked about Sandy City BCDM, which is uh, down here on the bottom, at the bottom of that last slide. And uh, the reason I brought donuts today is because if these guys shut down, I would have a heart attack. <laughs> this is my critical infrastructure every morning. Not every morning, but. Um, and the, the reason I'm going to talk about these guys is because uh, this is a great example of a private sector partner. Uh, or a private sector organization that has established partnerships within its own industry. So partnerships don't only have to be public and private, they can be cross-sector and they can be within the sector. Um, back in 2002, Mike, Steve, yeah. you guys did a video and it was called Not Business as Usual. Not Business as Usual. And you guys interviewed, somebody interviewed Doug Dunford. And Doug uh, had gone out and established partnerships with local bakers that in the case of an emergency, um, their, their competitors could come in and use their facilities, could come in and their, use their refrigeration units, could use their bakery, um, because they're all in this together. This, this is his quote. Um, we're all friends, we all know each other, we have a common problem, common problems and common challenges. So when that occurs, we're very happy to help. And where we can, we do. It's been a good thing for us and it's been a good thing for our so-called competitors, because we're in this thing together. Um, he went on to, uh, I, I got some information, I called, I went and talked to Dunford because I said, you know, this was in 2002, do you guys still have those relationships established? And he said, yes, we do. And so I talked a little bit more, we elaborated on that. Um, installing a backup, this is what came out of that, installing a backup generator is an excellent way to prevent problems when power to freezers or other equipment goes out, which they have, but if that's beyond what you can afford, a simple no-cost agreement with another business may be all that's necessary. Dunford Bakers have allowed other bakers uh, bakeries to use their massive walk-in freezers and bakery ovens when temporary power, power outages have shut them down. Dunford also has mutual agreements with partners out of Denver and Las Vegas who would produce and deliver their products in the event of a catastrophic disaster in Salt Lake that shuts down their West Jordan facility. Great example of a company who takes preparing seriously. Are there any comments or questions or injects up to this point? Okay, we'll keep going. I need to check my time real quick. 25 minutes. Sure. Let me bring you the mic since we got a lot of people in the room.
So it's more, it's more of a question. Um, I, I'm curious to know, I almost see that um, the, the Chamber of Commerce could become like a, a separate IMT team almost um, to, to coordinate with the EOC in a disaster. But I, I, Matt, Matt, you can answer this. I, was, I can't remember what, um, I think it was Hurricane Katrina. The oil companies kind of got together and did the same thing where they, uh, they kind of became an IMT team and then they were able to communicate what their needs were for, uh, you know, to, to the EOC. And, and uh, um, I'm just wondering if, if anyone's aware of any of that happening in Utah how, and how it's happened or if there's any other examples of how that's happened. Did you want to talk about that, Matt? Do you know? Yeah. Debbie. Awesome. Within the healthcare industry, I think we need to look to what we've developed in terms of our healthcare coalitions. Um, there are, they are regionally raised. I'm affiliated with the Salt Lake Summit and Tulum County healthcare coalitions where we meet on a regular basis and try to support one another and exercise and train and go Terry. She's the boss. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I really like this uh, slide because I think that this lays out why, why establish public-private partnerships. Value, and value is all about benefits minus costs. Um, here's some potential values of partnerships. More innovation, better depth of experience, more commodities, broader reach, force multiplier, increased sense of social responsibility, more community buy-in, better supply chain management, and improved flow of communication. I think that um, if you look at any public-private partnership, I was thinking about, I really wanted to integrate that Dunford example more into my presentation, but I didn't have time. So, uh, but I, I the reason, I, the, the way I wanted to integrate it more into my, my presentation was to talk about how you can basically take any company and Find a value that would uh, the benefits would outweigh the costs of creating a partnership with them. And I thought, how could how could a partnership with Dunford Donuts help? How could it help? What does Dunford have? They have food, right? They have delivery trucks. They have employees. If your partnership with Dunford, if you had a partnership with Dunford, and you had a shelter and you needed breakfast, who do you think you could call to provide breakfast? Okay. So the point of that is that I think with any business that you take, you can come up with a value of creating a partnership with them. Even if that partnership doesn't help you necessarily, it may keep you from having to help restore their business or worry about their uh, income taxes coming back to the city or worry about taking care of their employees. Let's talk about needs, drivers, and motivators real quick. I'm going to speed through these a little bit. Um, value to commodities, access to information, restoration of services, access to resources, assistance in emergency planning, and a seat at the table. Um, I'm not going to read all this, but value to communities. Obviously, there's a value to being involved in uh, public-private partnerships. When uh, a private sector company such as the ones that attend the, um, the Private Sector Emergency Coordinating Council come to the table, they feel a sense of community. Oftentimes they're given opportunities to put their name out there, um, maybe be, on, you know, uh, be able to sponsor some kind of an event, uh, invite in the emergency management community, uh, in, our, in our case it was Be Ready Utah, to come out to events, um, which shows that they're active in their community and that they care about um, preparedness. Access to information, this is huge. Um, we've got a few things that um, that I just wanted to share on here. When it comes to information systems, many information systems include the internet, telecommunication systems, um, and other systems are owned by the private sector. Partnerships allow for greater access to the information systems and therefore more ease in disseminating information to the public. Uh, Skip down to um, emergency notification. During an incident, leaders uh, within the private sector need the best information available so that they can direct their employees and can continue to provide services. When they receive substantive, substan 
substantive, timely, and actionable information in emergency notification situation reports, they can better respond and recover. That's something else that we do in my organization is we get the situation reports that come out um, from the state, which are helpful to have. Um, some of those situation reports that we've used actively have been on the wildfires that we've had. Uh, that was something else that I, that I, talk, I talked to Brian about. I wasn't there at the time uh, when they were working with the wildfires, but he said probably three or four times a year, we make a call out to some of our employees um, based on the information we get from the situation reports when it comes to the wildfire. It may not seem like a lot, but it, it certainly means a lot um, to the organization to know that we have the information to notify the employees in those areas that are affected, um, that we care about them and that we want to help them be prepared and know how to respond. Restoration of services um, is, is extremely important. Being able to work together to uh, restore vital services, and I'll talk more about um, this when we, when we get to the, uh, discussing the National Infrastructure Protection Program. Has anybody heard of the, the NIP, National Infrastructure Protection Program? We'll talk about that shortly here in a minute, but that is all about restoring services through partnerships. Resources for response um, is extremely important. The public sector cannot always stage enough resources such as water, medicine, lumber, and electrical cable to respond to any public incident or possible incident. For example, the need to stockpile water can be made unnecessary through targeting, targeted partnerships. A city or community could be faced with a deadly heat wave, and in the response, they might enter into a partnership with a private company to provide water in sufficient quantities. Um, I know that uh, an example of this was um, back when I was with the state, we had an incident. I think it was, maybe Ty, you can help me with this, because I can't remember exactly what uh, community it was, but it was out west of Tooele. There was a community who um, somehow their main water supply line was was broken. Um, can you help me with that? Who was it? I have a pop. Sorry? I have a pop. Okay. I'm not going to repeat that. But... It's a reservation. Reservation out west of Tula. Uh, no, I know, and I know, Wade, you probably know about this the situation too. Um, but I think uh, what finally happened was the county uh, decided that they could provide water. Is that correct? Yeah. But before that call came, I got a call from the liaison in the area asking if, as the private sector liaison, I could make a phone call to Walmart, who I knew and had a good relationship established with the liaison from Walmart, and made that phone call and had water lined up to go out there. It was that easy. It was a simple phone call. There was no formal written agreement. It was just those relationships being established and me knowing who to call and them knowing who I was when I called them, being able to say, yeah, we, I just need to make a phone call up to my supervisor and then we'll be able to, to truck water out there. And we ended up not having to do that, but that resource was available. Uh, manpower is another thing you can tap into. So here's a list of some of the resources that I think that um, it is good to go over for the private, uh, that you can, <coughs> the private sector. Can we talk about supplies, food, water, um, equipment such as transportation, telecommunications, technical um, specialized skills and expertise, um, we'll jump forward to public resources. I think this one's huge. Training and emergency management, including incident command, NIMS, and other applicable training. Um, shortly after I left the state and started, and started with uh, Zions, we wanted to review our risk assessment program and how we evaluate risk uh, at our company. And uh, there was an opportunity to attend um, a risk assessment course through the state that FEMA was providing. Uh, and I was able to come back and, and bring a member of my team and attend that training. And that actually was very good training that we were able to take back and help us implement and know how to do a proper risk assessment. Now, a lot of it's um, public sector heavy, I guess, is a, for lack of a better term. But it's still applicable to what we do. We can take parts of it um, out that, that apply to us and then we were able to uh, take that information and we're moving forward now with a risk assessment. And one of the other things that, um, uh, that we've been able to do with our risk assessment is go to the state emergency management agency and also to, uh, you know, we know we can go to our county and 
we can look for GIS data, information that will tell us, map out our critical facilities, here they are, here's the locations of them, please help us as we do our risk assessment, know what risks and threats are the highest and, and what to prepare for in these areas. Um, now we think we know in the private sector, we had a pretty good understanding that you know, earthquake might affect um, our, our facility in West Valley, but we had no idea how the, the fact that until we had that conversation with the state that we were in a very high liquefaction zone. We knew that liquefaction might be a factor, but we didn't realize we were in a high liquefaction zone, which means we can plan on flooding in that building. And so that's helping us to change our plans and make preparations for that facility. Those are the kind of things that help us um, when I talk about training and emergency management. Another thing that um, I'll say about training and emergency management, one of the, the things that I've learned is um, we don't really need help in business continuity planning when it comes to our company because we're large, we have people to do it. That's not to say that small companies don't need help, but where we do need help is in emergency management planning. Um, when we look at our emergency management plans, our evacuation plans, um, trying to know what the regulations are, you know, in our building, where do we have to have the evacuation routes posted and how many and does it matter the size of the building or the occupancy level? How many signs do we have to have because of that? We don't know those things. And so we reach out to the emergency management community to find out uh, information like that. I think that a lot of the NIMS training, or a lot of the uh, ICS and, and NIMS training is very important, very applicable to the private sector. And one of the things that, um, that I came up with was uh, a list of private sector training courses or they're not necessarily private sector training courses, but they apply to the private sector. Um, I don't know that I've got enough for everybody here, and Ty, would you mind helping me pass these out? How are my Since you're my friend. How much they're paying you for this? I think I'm up to like a quarter for all my comments, and well, I'll take whatever. Well, you're in the room, so I'm gonna pick on you. You probably have to have people share. All right, you two share. Do you want to tell them who's sharing? All right. But uh, I compiled this list by just, this is, um, you know, I'm on one of the, one of the uh, FEMA training email updates that always comes out that you get. And every time that I see one over the last couple of years that I think applies to private sector, schools, communities, individuals, I started putting that on a Word doc. And that Word doc started growing and growing and growing. I think it goes front to back. There are a lot of courses um, that a lot of people can benefit from that are free. And I think that there's just a simple lack of knowledge that those courses exist. So even if you did nothing but throw out the opportunity to take these courses to the businesses in your community, not only are you helping them um, prepare, but you're helping yourself by knowing that they uh, are receiving this training. And don't be afraid to invite them to ICS training. Uh, I think one of the most underused and important trainings that the state offers is uh, the, uh, now, it, now it drops out of my mind, but it's the PIO, the PIO course. It's extremely beneficial um, to any organization, especially private sector organizations that may not deal with disasters on a regular basis. For them to come and take that course and walk through and know the important things that they need to prepare for when uh, standing in front of the media after a disaster um, is extremely uh, beneficial. And a lot of them don't know about it. Early warning systems in large communities, employees about in, uh, impending and occurring disasters, again, um, the website, emergency info Utah, and then mess it up, dot com. Um, provide risk uh, and hazard assessment information on, on historical data. Um, I, I'm gonna pick on you, Jim, real quick, and this was a community a community-based uh, event that we held, but it could have easily been a private sector meeting, and that was when I asked you to come to my community, I live, I live in Layton, and share with us Layton City's emergency plan. And what did you do? You brought maps and talked about the plan. These are the evacuation routes that we have set up. These are the areas. This is where you are located, so this is where you're going to go. That information was very helpful to our community. Now, if you did nothing, in a year, but set up a one-time meeting to meet with the, the businesses in your community to simply go over the emergency plan for your city. How beneficial would that be for them to know? Oh, I fall in that zone? That's my evacuation route? Okay, that's good to know. 
Um, if that's all you do, then you can say you've established public-private partnerships. Again, they don't have to be formal meetings on a regular basis to call it a partnership. Okay. A position in the Emergency Operations Center, if you have one, um, ESF 15 would be a great place to sit. Somebody from the private sector, if you can go that far into your private sector program. Uh, I think we've kind of talked about this one quite a bit, assistance in emergency planning and response. Any, any, um, any comments on that? From what I talked about, I, I said that I don't think that business continuity is something that a lot of companies need. A lot of companies do need it, um, but some of the bigger companies don't. But emergency planning is something that they all need to help in. So think about that as you establish partnerships. It's not to say that, I mean, Matt and I were talking about this earlier, it's not to discredit something like the 12-point program. It's very beneficial for small businesses who don't have somebody that does um, business continuity planning and doesn't know anything about it. Um, but it may not be beneficial for, for my company. But um, emergency management training and, and those conversations are very, very beneficial for us. Uh, a seat at the table um, is very important. It provides the private sector a voice in policy decision making, a voice in emergency response operations, opportunities to attend meetings, voice concerns, contribute. Um, Be Ready Utah is a great example of that um, with their emergency management uh, private sector steering committee, um, which is uh, brings local leaders, again, to the table, to a physical table, to sit down and talk to the policy directors, to those who make the decisions when we were when we were uh, having those, holding those meetings, the people in the room were, um, you know, executive management from companies like Questar and Rocky Mountain Power and, and the banking industry and postal and shipping and uh, healthcare and um, all different types of, of, of sectors. And then you had the commissioner of public safety who would come to those meetings and you had Keith Squires who at the time was our director and you had the lieutenant governor there. Um, those kind of meetings are where real decisions can be made and real um, suggestions and concerns can be voiced and then things can, can come out of that. Um, some of the things that came out of uh, our work with the private sector, let me find where I'm at. Some of the things that we were able to achieve um, with the uh, steering committee, uh, there was a governor's power Governor's Powers legislation passed in 2010. Um, we talked a lot about credentialing. We didn't get quite to where we wanted to be, but we did get to a point where we had a mutual understanding of, of what credentialing should look like. Um, there wasn't anything formal done with that, but, but there was a lot of conversation. And then um, we talked a lot about um, uh, setting up uh, mutual aid agreements and the uh, Utah Banking Association came up with the Banking Reciprocal, Reciprocal Aid Agreement, which basically set up agreements to where uh, if in local communities banks experience disasters, then competitors would allow customers from other banks to come and use uh, their banking to do uh, simple things like transactions, withdrawals, deposits, and those kind of things. Maybe not to the, the, the excess of loans and things, but at least to get through uh, the disaster. So those are the, the kind of things that you can accomplish through that type of partnership. Another one to look up, you can Google, is the Missouri Public Private Partnership. They have a very good uh, program that involves a lot of their policy directors in their state. So um, if you don't know anything about the National Infrastructure Protection Program, I would suggest that you join this conference call next Monday. <laughs> um, they actually just recently updated it. I think the last one was 2000 nine or eight, uh, and they just uh, revamped the 2013 NIP. Now this outlines, um, they changed it from 18 critical infrastructure sectors to 16. If you're wondering, the two that dropped off, I believe it was national monuments, and postal and shipping. The rest are chemical, commercial facilities. And think about this if you have any of these in your communities. Critical manufacturing, dams, emergency services, government facilities, What's that one? Nuclear reactors, banking, finance, communications, defense, industrial base, energy, food and ag, food and ag, healthcare and public health, 
excuse me, information technology and transportation and water. Um, so those are the critical infrastructure players that they've lined out in the NIP. If you don't know much about the NIP, I have a little uh, flyer up here that you're welcome to come up and take. I won't pass these around, but I've got about 40 of them. Um, this has, this doesn't have information on the call that's coming up, but the call is basically going to go over some of the, the, the big changes that they've made to it. Um, again, it's uh, Monday at 11 to noon Eastern, so if you can make it at 9 a.m., great, our time. Uh, this is the call number. <coughs> you want to write that down? And this is the passcode. Can anybody not see it? No. Okay, I'll, I'll say it. Yes. The number, this is not a raffle, is 888. <laughs> 888-889-4460 and the passcode is 983-0996. Anybody not get that? If you have time, join it. Uh, they'll be going over these things. These are the uh, revisions that were made. Like I said, they reduced the number of critical sectors from 18 to 16. Uh, reflects today's integrated all hazards environment, great focus on integration of cyber and physical security efforts, refining information sharing processes, um, and reinforcing existing security and resilience partnerships. It's uh, interesting if you haven't looked into the, the NIP, I would suggest doing that. And they also have a training course, I think it's on that list that I sent around. You can take a uh, IS course for, for the NIP. So I wanted to leave you with some of the resources. I wanted to kind of give you, in my time working in, uh, in establishing public and private partnerships, these are some of the resources I found very beneficial. And I think they'll be beneficial for you. FEMA.gov slash private sector. If you want to read about partnerships, models of success, go to this website. Um, they actually have a section on the left-hand side called models of success. Utah's one of them but there are other models that you can read about that have very good programs from formal programs to informal programs. Um, you can get a lot of ideas from going there. The other reason that I use that website is to sign up for email alerts, which I have forwarded to, well, I don't anymore, but in my time at the state, I would forward to our lists of businesses and found that to be very beneficial for them. Um, DHS also has their own private sector um, website. It's very heavily based on uh, Homeland Security related information, so it's not quite uh, on the same preparedness level, but uh, if you're into, the, into those things, you can go there. Ready Campaign's a great um, online resource. They have a lot of good resources, ready.gov uh, ready slash business. Um, this is just basically what you can get to from going to the private sector, these models. Communities of practice, has anybody, has anybody signed up with communities of practice? Get some pretty good information from them. Uh, a lot of good emails come out of them, got a lot of good correspondence. It's uh, communities.firstresponder.gov. Spend some time on their website. Um, you have to apply to be on their list, but I, I think all you have to do is outline that you're a government agency or private sector and you can get on that list. Um, these are some of the email distribution lists. This is an example of uh, the FEMA, FEMA private sector tip of the week. These are two examples. So the last couple that I got, this one was all about small business disaster toolkit uh, in December, and then I got one a few days ago. Um, store weather radio, emergency food, supplies at the office to prepare your business for weather, for winter weather. And then it's got a link for them to uh, go and find out more about that information. Those are great things and a great way to establish partnerships by if you've got a listserv of businesses, shoot them out these emails. I used to do that um, with the private sector group and I used to get people responding back and saying thank you, we can use this information, it's good information. It's a very simple thing to do. Uh, this is another one that I use a lot, individual and preparedness, community preparedness e-brief. Um, I believe you get to that one through uh, FEMA.gov slash private sector. It's kind of a uh, newsletter style email. 
Does anybody follow this one, the EMR ISAC? Anybody? You do Q? This one actually has a lot of really good stuff that comes out. So here's one that I that I used that I found very useful, USF A Guide for Active Shooter Response. Basically it's just a infogram that comes out. It's like a mini newsletter. It's usually got four or five articles and a lot of times the information on or maybe one of the articles is very applicable to the private sector. Um, so I sign up for that. I get that on a regular basis. The website for that is, and if you miss any of these, you can come up afterward, but usfa.dhs.gov forward slash, and there's a space there, emr-isac, I-S-A-C. And I'm trying to read. The Emergency Management and Response Information Sharing and Analysis Center. That's what that stands for. Um, other resources, sba.gov is an excellent resource for webinars if you want to promote and, and, and share webinars with, uh, with partners. Um, here's a great webinar coming up next Tuesday to give you an idea. What uh, 2013's disasters teach us about being prepared? Business continuity tips discussed at a free webinar. They do these all the time. And they usually do them in conjunction with a company called Agility Recovery, who uh, is a private company and they do a lot of um, consulting work. They are a vendor, but they're also a very good company who is very open to just giving information out about the yeah, I was just going to say to mention that uh, their focus is IT. No, maybe business company planning as well. Yes, I was just going to say the last webinar I watched that it had agility involved. They had tons of great information regarding IT companies. So if that's something you feel you're vulnerable to, or you can spread that. They're they're pretty all inclusive. They do a little bit of everything. So um, yeah, you can sign up for this stuff at sba.com/disaster. Uh, this one's next Tuesday from 12 to 1 Mountain Standard. The only thing about these webinars, most of the time they're 2 to 3 Eastern, so it's your lunch time, but that's not too bad. Sit at your computer and watch a webinar. Um, you can come up and get this information. I'm not going to read this off, but if you're interested in that, you can come up after. I'll give you the information on, on how to get there. Uh, preparedness campaigns. Be Ready Utah, uh, Red Cross, the Ready, Ready, Ready Rating Program, Ready.gov, the Small Business Administration. Um, one of the things I was wanted to mention that I've seen actually used quite a bit um, around the country is these uh, events in a box is what they're being called. And that's where we provide you what you would need to create your own booth. And we did that with the Be Ready Utah program a few years back where we went out to each of the counties and provided the county emergency manager with an event in a box. It had everything you would need, including a tablecloth and a pull-up banner and all the information you want to put out on the, on the table. Uh, and that's something that you can provide um, to anybody who needs it. You can make it a resource available. You don't have to have a whole bunch of them, but you can put it out there. We have an event in a box. If you want to put on a preparedness event, and maybe we don't have the resources to bring somebody out, but you can come and borrow our box if you want. Um, the Great Utah Shakeout Emergency Notification, they do preparedness presentations, trainings, booths, social media. Um, I think we all use Be Ready Utah quite a bit. The private sector uses them too. The Red Cross Ready Rating Program is an excellent uh, 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 preparedness program for businesses. And I just wanted to go over to uh, conclude some things to consider. Um, hold exercises and invite private sector partners to participate. I think that we need to include them a little bit more where we can in exercises. Use email distribution lists and web pages to keep them appraised of training and information. It's okay if people join just to get their name on the list. There were quite a few people um, over the time that I was over the, the uh, coordinating council that came and I knew that they were there just to sell something. I knew they were there and didn't necessarily provide any, any kind of resource. Um, but that was okay because having them on the list sometimes led to me meeting somebody else that they knew um, or being able to link them to somebody um, that I knew that they could be useful to. Um, and I'll give you... Uh, I don't want to say they're an example of that because that would, I don't want to talk like that about them, but this is an example of somebody who I didn't really see um, use for the state to use, but maybe the county, and that was Cardinal Health. Um, Cardinal Health 
started coming to our meetings and we went out there and we looked at their facility and they invited me out um, and a great facility uh, they're a pharmaceutical company that provides medicine and you know, I didn't really know how we could use them at the state but I was able to link them up with the county uh, because their facility is actually right along the same road as the county emergency operations center so I thought oh well that's a good that's a good uh, touch point there is is to get them involved with the county emergency management so I know they've I don't know where those meetings went, but I know they did have those meetings. So it doesn't necessarily have to be somebody who provides value to you. If they want to come to the table, give them a seat at the table. Um, you never know where that could go. And then work with trade, or trade organizations to get your message out. We found that the more trade organizations we worked with, the more we were able to extend our message uh, with when I was with the state and the Utah. Uh, organizations like um, BOMA, Utah Trucking Association, um, and all the associations that we were involved with, I won't list them all, but it's a great way to get your message out, to meet with businesses um, by getting involved with uh, trade organizations. That's all I have for today. I hope that you've been able to learn something. Um, there is, um, my phone real quick. Yeah, that's all I've got for today, but I do have uh, one more thing that if you wanna, if you wanna learn a little bit about it, the New York Emergency Management Office um, has a really good program that's a formal private sector program um, that I found out about a few days ago and did a little, quite a bit of research on. And there's a really good PDF of a kind of a um, preparedness in a box program that they have that uh, you might benefit from. So if you're interested, come up. I'll grab your email or something and send that to you. So thank you for your time, everyone.